Welcome back to Betting People with Matthew Shadid of Smarkets. Now, Matthew, just want to dig a bit into process. Um, now, of course, there is a bit of a different tone here because now you work for Smarkets, although there is a sports book um, as we've established um, as part of Smarkets. But um, a couple of questions I got from none other than Ben Keith really interested me. The four I'd um, ask you them because um, this is all about basically odds making. Um, now, when you make a book and you've got a good position already, um, which can, well, is very much the case for things like general elections and also presidential elections. Um, is the market new to you every day or do you trade according to that position? And he asked that and I sort of agree because you trade markets and the prices can move quite, with quite a lot of volatility, um, as I'm sure you'll be aware of either in running or um, throughout the course of the campaign. Well, the logical and most efficient thing to do as a bookmaker or a punter is just to forget about what's happened already, forget about the bets that have been struck or your position that you've already been left with, whether it be good or bad, and just try and trade the prices as accurate as you can do, or at least the ones that are most efficient to offer to the market. Um, so yeah, you, you should try hard to forget about the liabilities. I think that some of the best betting operations actually stop some of their traders even looking at the liabilities while they're trading things. Uh, because there is a very natural instinct to try and balance things up. If either way, if you're doing badly, uh, to try and get some money in the other way. But in the long run, that's going to cost you money. You're much better off just forgetting about that and just trying to. I mean, there'll be times when you have very big liabilities, or something like last year's U.S. election, where you've agreed some you know, risk management plan with your superiors, where you know you're not really allowed to lose more than X million pounds. And so, therefore, that has to be in the back of your mind when you're laying or declining bets, um, but mostly as a, you know, e e whichever side of the bet you're on, you're best off forgetting about your previous liabilities. For the last, um, for the Trump-Biden um, election, um, was there a point pre-election um, day where you sort of had that red light that you were going to pass? Um, no, that was more of a sort of constant discussion that was going on in the, with the trading management, and I must say the, the um, Tom Zima, who's the trading director at Entain now, um, was very good and those guys went a lot further than I thought they were going to go uh, because, uh, well at least partly because I think I'd convinced them that this was the greatest political lay of all time trying to take on Trump. Um, so the fact that it was a lot closer than I anticipated didn't help. <laughs> but um, no, they, they gave me a lot of support. Um, and you know, when you do a company like Intain, of course, you know, losing several million pounds of election is, gonna, is painful, uh, but it's not going to affect the share price, right? There's um, another 364 days of the year where they can um, uh, be a profitable company. So, yeah, they, they, they were pretty good, and so I didn't ever hit that line, although that does, that does happen sometimes. Politics and special betting is a modern area, and perhaps, you know, maybe the only area where there is no international market, or and prices are made. At, well, there is an international market, but where, generally speaking, um, your know, prices are made up of knowledge and feel, and sometimes knowing your customer base, um, particularly or, but before you know you start to get your really detailed polling. Uh, in some cases, of course, it varies for election, uh, not um, as a bookmaker. Apart from those who have inside knowledge of a particular event, what skill do you see in the punter that enables them to win, basically? Um, betting on politics on Well, one thing you've got to do is try and clear away any kind of wishful thinking bias that you might have in your... I mean, it's just natural... Again, this is a kind of natural thing that all of us have. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a tendency to believe that what we want to happen is more likely to happen than it actually <laughs> is. We, you can see this in polls. When you ask... Uh, when you ask... Before the EU referendum, you'd ask people, what do you think the result of this referendum is going to be? Well, guess what? Remain voters were much more likely to say Remain's going to win and Leave voters were much more likely to say Leave's going to win. Um, and of course that kind of bias, once you're aware of it as a bookmaker or a punter, you know that may actually end up being reflected in the market. Um, if one side, for instance, is more likely to place a bet. I mean, if you think, think about the Scottish referendum, that was quite a good example, mm. where the um, independent side were much more passionate, much more visible, it seemed to me. Um, but also, in some ways, they were they were they more overlapped with the sort of betting community. They were more male. People who wanted to leave the UK were, were um, leave the union were more male. I think one of the biggest votes for independence in that referendum was in Dundee. That may have even been the number one place 
where um, the yes vote got the highest totals. Dundee also happens to be, I've been told, one of the biggest betting cities in the UK. So if there's an overlap between the betting, the kind of people who like to place a bet and the kind of people who feel one particular way about an election, well, of course, that might distort the market a bit. It's not a perfect market where everybody's just rationally acting. Um, there's a lot of bias in there. And so trying to be able to spot that is probably the most important thing. Do you think there are sides in some political betting markets um, that are particularly overbet or, or underbet? Or actually, I might widen that. Do you think there are some candidates or political parties that have been particularly overbacked and underbacked? I'm, I'm thinking about um, Marine Le Pen being such a short price after um, Trump and Brexit. Yeah. But I wonder if there are any other examples. Yeah, I think we, we kind of touched on that before, didn't we? I mean, there was a, a, there seemed to be a run of European elections where people were always backing the most populist right-wing candidate or party to win. So that seemed like an easy way of um, making some money by trying to oppose that. I mean, I think there is some evidence that in general, in UK politics, that perhaps we have tended to overrate the Conservatives. You look at by-elections we've had recently. I think the only four by-elections since 2015 where the favourite hasn't won have all been the Tories losing seats they're expected to win. Or, no, one example, it was... Um, the uh, Farage's new party lost in Peterborough in the way they're expecting oh, they yes, tend to run on. Memories. Um, so maybe there's something in that. Maybe there, maybe there is a general tendency of the betting markets just to overrate the right. The, you know, the, the right. I don't know. Uh, that doesn't mean I would, you know, set up a system saying let's just bet Labour every time there's a by-election or anything else. Um, but that's sort of at the back of my mind when I'm sort of setting up prices. Um, when you're setting up a political market. Um, what is your process, um, particularly for something that isn't an election, yeah. where there aren't necessarily you know, good polling data, you know, there's polls every week going back decades for most elections now, um, but outside, as we know, there's lots of side bets for political betting. Um, what's your process, or what used to be your process, I should say, when setting up on those markets? Well, there is still some of that process going on here, because we're, um, at least in conjunction with the trading arms markets, um, we're sort of seeding markets here to start to start the ball rolling in exchanges, so we have to come up to some price in the first place. Um, at the moment, it's something that just isn't amenable to any sort of statistical analysis. You've got lots of polls, that's fine, you can build models and try and work out what's happening from that. It's a process of informed guesswork. The more people you can get to contribute to that initial estimate, the better. So I have, um, I'm lucky enough to work with Patrick Flynn here, who's a very talented um, analyst. So there's at least two of us there who can both independently come up with some prices and average them if that's what we want to do. If you know anybody else who happens to have an opinion on these things or is well informed, then of course I might drop them a line. But the the process generally is, yeah, you, you come up with some kind of fairly guessy estimate for some of these things. Um, in the world of fixed odds betting, you probably have very low maximum stake limits for a few days. You hope that your informed customer base will push the price in the right direction, it doesn't cost you too much money and then you can just let the market take over. Thank you very much for your time in this part of Burning People, Matthew Shelley. Thank you.